Today's readings are from Colossians chapter 1. For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him, and through him to reconcile all things to himself. Having made peace through the blood of his cross, through him I say whether things on earth or things in heaven. Communion is an opportunity to reflect and remember the death of our Lord. The death of Jesus Christ, however, is not one of a martyr. Everyone's like, oh, they, they, they treat it as a martyrdom. Rather than a martyrdom, we need to understand that the death of Jesus Christ is one of sacrifice. They did, not, they did seek to kill Jesus, but it would not have occurred if he did not allow it. This was a murder, but it was permitted by Jesus and actually orchestrated by the Father. We do not mourn his death because he is alive. We have a hope in Scripture that teaches us to look toward the return of he who was slain but is alive forevermore. Therefore, do not grieve. Remember. Remember the glorious sacrifice. Remember the love. And remember that we are children of God because of his gift. We do not focus on ourselves, on our issues. This past week, we focus on him. Let's pray. God, thank you for all you've done for us. We pray for those who cannot be with us today or those who are of us but not with us as we remember you. That it's not about the elements that we take, but rather that's simply a, an opportunity to speak as one. That we can speak as one on a regular basis if we remain consistent with the message of your love, your grace, your sacrifice, and your resurrection. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. First John, we are going to finish up. Well, when I when I made the lesson, I I, I had absent mindedly didn't remember communion. So it's just about a I'll, I'll finish if I can, but I'm not going to rush it. I want to make sure we get this out through. Um, it is on 1 John 1, 10 through 2, 2. We will finish, hopefully, the, uh, the, the text of this preamble. But then we will go into a few lessons dealing with the theology of this preamble. Because we can deal with the interpretation. What does this mean to the audience to whom it was written? But we still have to talk about the way it's used. And we need to talk about the various different ways it's used. I'm going to talk about... A whole spectrum of different ways that this is understood and not only talk about what we should use it for but also kind of refute some of the i think the the, the miss the misses that are that have been made about this particular lesson the author of first john who is an apostle writes this letter to a body of believers who have permitted the antichrist to spread their false message that jesus is not the messiah some of the body has fallen prey to this false teaching and the apostles are now confronting them directly the author does not use a rod in this letter. Rather, he leads them using a loving, caring hand, using examples and rhetoric to have their recipients come along, not through force, but through encouragement of love and engagement with careful thought. The goal is to bring them into conformity with the apostolic teaching about Jesus, the Messiah. Remember that we are uh, what we learned about spirituality and sin this is done by feeding our spirit. And then we have to make sure that we understand our responsibility for dealing with our afflictions as sin is living godly and sensibly while denying ungodliness and worldly desires. How do you do that? How do you, how do you stop doing the bad things and be good? How do you do that? Well, number one, you feed your spirit with the word of God. You cannot really accomplish anything spiritually beneficial without feeding your spirit consistently the word of God. Second is dwelling upon it. Even if you can't read at the moment or taking lessons, dwell upon the truth. And I would say, be, go back to basics. 
dwell upon the love of God. Uh, Romans chapter 5, Philippians chapter 2, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. God demonstrated his own love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We consistently dwell upon that truth and the love of God. And then as we continue to grow in understanding of God's desires and will and overall plan, we intentionally flee immoral activity and thought. Comes about? No. But you cannot simply flee it. You can't simply just stop it. Just say no doesn't work. You have to replace it. Galatians 5.16 is the concept behind that, which says, but I say walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. That word carry out is complete. You will sin. But if you walk by, and it's not the Spirit, remember we talked about this, but walk by your renewed human spirit, that which you fill the Word of God into, if you do that repetitively, you will not fulfill the uh, overall completion and desires of the flesh. Doesn't mean you won't sin. It means you will not let it succeed in its plan. In 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 9, we've... Um, uh, back up. Okay. Uh, 5 through 9, we've covered this over the last several lessons. Very slowly, snail pace. Some people say a snail on the back of a turtle pace. Uh, I understand that. I hopefully you find it very valuable in the, what we've been doing in order to be able to establish certain truths about what we're reading. This message, we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. And if we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we say the same thing about or concerning our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So once again, the author does not assault the readership with direct confrontation. Uh, instead, he gives hypotheticals so the audience can realize for themselves that they have rebelled against the truth. This rebellion, this fact of them actually allowing Antichrist in their midst is what they're being admonished for. They have been influenced from an antichrist to teach that Jesus is not the Christ. That's the sin. That is walking in darkness. Allowing that, permitting that, teaching that is walking in darkness in this text. Because of that influence, they have to be confronted. The believers need to openly agree. Homologeo, confess, openly agree that this is egregious sin. That this is wrong. And to say with one voice their error and walk in the light of the truth. You cannot simply go, well, we're not going to mention it again. You need to say, that was wrong. We should not have done that. We should not have allowed that. And if you're fallen prey to that, you're in error. You need to, to confront that directly. However, during the admonishment, the author reassures the reader that God is faithful and just and forgives and cleanses all believers. We've talked about that in understanding the last couple of weeks. I pray that this is understood and we'll continue to kind of re, re, uh, reassure this uh, understanding as we move forward into the theological impact in the next couple of weeks. In verse 10, we have a reiteration. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and the, world, and the word is not in us. I was simply going to skip this because it's, uh, cause I kind of covered it a couple of times. I do want to kind of bring out a few things about this verse before we move on to chapter two, even though that big chapter two, a big two right there is the worst two in the, in the Bible. It should not be there. That big two should be after verse two because the disconnect is, is, is makes it really bad for a lot of people who read this. So verse 10 is a reiteration of verse eight. Denial that there is a sin issue in reference to this audience would indicate two things. One, we make him a liar. And number two, his word is not in us. We make him a liar. Remember, the we is a collective of the apostles and the intended audience. When we deal with the intended message, we deal with the intended message, we understand that there's a particular situation to a group of believers who are in error. We don't have the same error. That doesn't mean that we can't apply anything from this, but we have to be very careful inserting ourselves into this situation, unless you're also entertaining the fact or entertaining the message that Jesus is not the Christ. Then absolutely make this a direct application. 
If the body of believers who are walking in darkness refuse to admit that they're in error, then what we are saying is that darkness is in God. Because the lie goes back to what? In 1 John. In 1 John, what is the lie? Go back to verse 5 and verse 6. What does it say? I'm getting there too. I was still in 1 Corinthians. This is the message we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light. And in him there is no darkness. So how can you have light mingled with darkness? If you say that that's okay, we haven't sinned, then what you're saying is there's darkness and light. And we make God a liar. If we say we have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie. If we say that that's not a problem, we are saying he's lying. That is the, it's the pericope of the lie. So once again, as ones who are in fellowship with God, walking in darkness and then failing to deal with that problem is akin to telling God that he is a liar. His word is not in us. Mirrors verse 8, which says his truth. Oh, wait a second. I have that backwards, don't I? Yeah, okay. His word. So his truth is in verse 8. His word in verse 10. Same idea. Again, what are we talking about here? Remember what we said about the author's rhetoric. The author uses rhetoric to engage the reader. He makes them think through a problem to understand the solution. He uses repetition, repeats the same idea, changing the word, this delivery to emphasize, provide variety, and explain. When people analyze 1 John, we get caught into trying to analyze every single word and make it sound, since it's said a little bit differently, we think it's a different message. It's repetition. So in regards to his truth is not in us and his word is not in us, they are not different thoughts. He's just changing the delivery, changing the words to help them understand fully exactly the problem. If you say in this situation, a, a group of believers who are having severe, significant doctrinal errors, specifically about Jesus Christ being the Messiah, and then you deny that, the word, his word's not in you, meaning it's not your guide. It does not mean you're not saved. It's not what he's saying here. That can be said very easily. It simply means that his, you're not being guided. You're not in the word, and the word is not in you. Why? Because if you're saying that Jesus is not the Christ or permitting that to happen, what, what's guiding you? What is your truth? This brings us to 1 John 2, 1 through 2, which we want to spend most of our time today. I've, I've, I've titled this Purpose and Advocacy, and our advocate, obviously, is the person of Jesus Christ. It reads, my little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. Again, the chapter break here is unfortunate. It's in the middle of a paragraph. Verses 1 and 2 should be at the end of chapter 1. Um, so if you if you can do your best, and I, by the way, next week I am going to give you my translation of 1 John chapter 1 all the way through 2, 2 as a document for everybody. I'll print them out. Everyone's going to have a copy of it just so you can. And I'm going to ha not going to have verse breaks. I may have a paragraph break, but I'm going to give that to you so that hopefully you can read it. Um, I'm not going to have any notes, so, you know, there are still going to be some questions if somebody reads it as to what these things mean, because we don't talk like this. But hopefully it will help you read uh, 1 John chapter 1 for a little bit better. With the previous 10 verses in mind, the author is informing the readers why verses 5 through 10 have been written. He addresses them as my little children, technion. Technion is a word that this author loves. It's, it's used primarily in 1 John. Um, it's used nine times. Seven of them are used in 1 John alone. 2.12 also uses, I'm writing to you little children, technion. 
228. Now, little children. Chapter 3, verse 7. Little children. Verse 18. Little children. Chapter 4, verse 4. You are, of my, you are from God, little children. Chapter 5, 21. Little children. So, if I called you all little children, would you take offense to that? Ah, yeah, you'd be like, what are you talking about? Even if I was, say, in my 80s, would you, if I called you all that little children, would you all like, not little children? So, a lot of people take this little children word and they go, he is being kind of snotty to them. He is, he is denouncing them as being grown. If you read the entire book, the entire letter, it's not what's happening at all. In fact, Jesus talks to the apostles like this. Little children, I'm with you a little while longer. Technically, same word. Galatians is the other book that uses this. And again, in Galatians 4.19, my children, who I'm, who I'm again in labor until Christ is formed in you. We talked about this verse in Galatians where Paul stops the beating and, and, and really shifts to a term of endearment. The word technion is not used to demean. It's, it's not that they wouldn't take offense to this. Technion is an endearing term. The author obviously has a direct connection to this group of believers as their spiritual father. So calling them children is kind of like how I talk to my kids. And I still call them children. I, I yell down in the basement all the time, children, <laughs> they're adults. Why? I love them. And they're, 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 they're part of my offspring. This is an offspring word, technion. And the author of 1 John is simply addressing whom he loves as somebody who cares with it as a familiar relationship, not simply an apostle, you know, underling relationship. He says, these things I write, the things I, the things refer to the immediate, immediate preceding information. It's not what follows. It's what's preceding. We know that because of how he, how the author writes the rest of the book. He never begins a section with that. He always ends a section with that. So therefore the, why are the first, uh, are the verses five through 10 written? What's the purpose? Now we also understand that. Because of the henna clause. These things I write so that. That word henna there always demonstrates a purpose or result depending upon the context. So that you would not sin. That's strange. That's, do you find that odd? I'm going to write to you something. And it's talking about darkness and light and not denying sin and, and all that kind of stuff. And I'm writing to you to not deny sin and then writing to you and then saying the purpose I'm writing to you is so that you would not sin. Didn't, didn't fit right with a lot of people. They're like, what is this? And so here we want to make sure we ask a couple questions and make a couple observations. First of all, it's a negative particle, may, with the verb harmatano. That is actually not used a whole lot. Now, in the way you can write this is do not sin or stop sinning. Okay? You can write it both ways and you would not be wrong. It depends upon whether or not the author is intending for the people to stop doing what they're doing or to prevent future activity. Okay? So when we deal with this passage here, we have to understand exactly what is he trying to get them to do? Because if the goal of this writing is to keep the reader from never sing again, what can we say? Fail. Because everyone from that point forward has sinned on a regular basis in general. So once again, the purpose of verses 5 through 10 
is so that the person who reads and brings into effect what is written, that's the idea, you read it and you bring into effect what's written, is that they do not sin. And we have to ask the question, is this sinning in general or is it speaking of a specific sin? If it's sinning in general, I have a problem with it because that's impossible. When Galatians, when Paul's talking about them, he says, walk in your renewed human spirit so that sin will not be fully accomplished. He never says so that you'll never sin. Why? Because we're in the flesh. And Paul, and Paul in Romans chapter 6 and 7 says, I've tried. My flesh wins a lot. Who will save me from this body of death? So once again, you can either re understand this as don't or stop or don't sin or stop sinning. And we have to kind of grasp this from the perspective of the writer and what is he intending to be understood. Now, the first thing I want to understand is how is this kind of word used? When you have this negative particle with sin, how is it understood in the most of the other sections? The first place we see stop sinning is as John chapter 5 verses 8 through 14 where we see Jesus said to him get up pick up your pallet and walk. Now this is to the lame man who's you know it's on the sabbath so don't do that it's bad. But Jesus said to do it so you know what this guy healed me I'm going to do it. Immediately the man became well, picked up his pallet and began to walk. Now it was on the sabbath day. So the Jews were saying to the man who was cured, it's the sabbath, it's not permissible for you to carry your pallet. Talk about your myopic nature of life, right? But he answered them, the one who made me well said, pick up your pallet and walk. So guess what? I'd rather obey him. They asked, who is this man that you said, pick up your pallet and walk? But the man who was healed did not know who it was. For Jesus had slipped away while there was a, there was a crowd in that place. Afterward, Jesus found him and said to him, behold, you have become well. Do not sin anymore so that nothing worse happens to you. Then he went away and told the Jews it was Jesus who made him well. Now, it gets kind of strange in the narrative. Exactly what was he doing that was sinning? We don't really know. Was he denying? Did he not know? Not really sure. However, what is Jesus telling him to do? Never sin or stop doing a particular action? Maybe it was in his intent. I don't know, and I don't want to know, because I don't want to. Jesus says, don't sin anymore. Stop it. Stop sinning. Stop doing a particular action, okay? That's what we find in John 5. John 8, I mentioned this last hour, is a story of the woman caught in adultery. I do not believe this is, is, this is actual original to the text, but it's there, and it does have language which we can use. So when Jesus kind of like distracted all the people from throwing stones at her, right, and everyone leaves and gets up and says, woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Go. For now on, sin no more. Is he telling her, don't ever sin in general? Or is it referring to the adultery? It's referring to the adultery. Don't stop doing that. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 34. This section is about the resurrection. Become sober-minded as you ought. Stop sinning. For some have no knowledge of God, and I speak this to your shame. This section's about the resurrection. We talked, we actually read this last hour as well. And many were becoming persuaded that there was no resurrection. Verse 35 confirms the topic has not changed. But some will say, How are the dead raised? And what kind of resurrection? Paul is not giving them a general charge to stop sinning. Rather, he is telling them, stop denying the resurrection. Stop allowing this kind of teaching to occur. And you notice he's calling a teaching about the resurrection has not occurred a sin, a rebellion. It's not about a moral activity. It's a bad doctrine. By Paul saying here, stop sinning, he is telling them to stop being influenced by the heretical teaching of no resurrection. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26. Be angry and, stop, and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Now, some may think that this is a general concept. The sentence is used surrounded by specific instruction. And then all of a sudden they go, oh, 
don't sin in general. That, that the, the verse is actually a direct quote uh, from Psalms. So if you want to go back and read Psalm, and you can get that as well, Psalm 4, 4. It's understood based upon the rest of the verse. When you are provoked, deal with it properly. Do not let it linger. The sin would be allowing it to be consistently within you, to hold a grudge, to act out in anger. He's not saying be angry and never sin again. In this situation, in your anger, don't sin. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 28 and 36. If you marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. Verse 36. But if any man thinks he is acting unbecomingly toward his own virgin daughter, again, this is strange. I don't, don't get bogged down on this. If she's past her youth, and if it must be so, let him do what he wishes. He does not sin. Let her marry. My point is this here, is the sinning here in both passages, dealing with sin in general. If you get married, you're no longer sinning. So to those of us who are married, guess what? We're free and clear. Right. No. It's talking about they're not sinning in that situation. In this situation, he is not sinning. So it's in dealing with particulars. So... All these verses are not a call to avoid sin in general. Rather, all of these verses have a particular problem, and the writer, the speaker, is indicating to the recipients that they should not sin regarding a specific sin. All of these verses do not prove that 1 John 2, 1 is also speaking specifically and not general. However, it gives us an indication of how language is used regarding don't sin or stop sinning. Okay. When you take into consideration the point of First John, do we get any indication that all of a sudden the writer is going to have a general statement? Stop sinning in general. I'm writing these things to you so that you would never sin again. Again, I think that would be foolish. So... This is not a call to avoid sin in general, although we should. We talked about sin in general and how we should act and react to sin in general. We have to try to stop it. And how do we stop it? Going back to our appendixes, appendici. <laughs> Sorry, language is hard. Read the word of God, dwell upon its truth, intentionally flee from sin, and then walk by your renewed human spirit, so you won't fulfill the flesh, the, the, the lust of the flesh. So, in 1 John 2, 1, can we, can we demonstrate that? The entire book, the entire letter, is about a specific issue. The sin is specific and refers to their rebellion in allowing these antichrists to speak, allowing these antichrists to teach, and even some of them to fall prey to their teaching. So when you read 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, and look at it and go, oh, I'm writing these things so that you may not sin. We have to put it into their context. I wrote these things to you, verses 5 through 10, so that you would stop doing what you've been doing in regards to the teaching about Jesus. And if anyone sins, what is this about then? Mm. Well, it, wait, Will, you, what you're saying is that if it's about particular sins, and if anyone should sin, because that's a third class conditional sentence, and maybe they will, maybe they won't, if anyone should sin, then is it still about the same situation? This third class indicates that maybe somebody would commit the sin that they are talking about. Hmm. See, if it was about sin in general, how would this be set up? If this is about sin in general, because we know that everyone sins, how would this sentence be set up? 
it would be a first class conditional sentence. And when you sin, or since you everyone sins, then, but it's not, it's still set up as a third class. But is it about the problem at hand? I think it is. See, the group of believers have been convinced of, of heeding false teachers and telling them that they should come back to the light with them. Yeah, that's what that's the message. Then he tells them if anyone should sin by following the false teachers, Jesus is still advocating for them. What? What? Now, for most people to hear something like this breaks them. Do you realize that when you sin and falling for false doctrine, because we've all done it, that's a sin. We realize that, right? That there's a false doctrine out there. It's not what God teaches. It's a you mischaracterize the theology, you mischaracterize who God is, you misunderstand, even for far off base. Because you're in him, Jesus still advocates for you. That is a grace that I cannot understand. If there is one thing that I would say that God should say, I'm not advocating for that. That is teaching that he is not what he says he is. What is an advocate? Well, the word is parakletos. We looked at this back in our upper room discourse teachings. The word parakletos means one called alongside. It's, of the, it's used of the Holy Spirit primarily in the Gospel of John. John 14, uh, John 15, and John 16 all call the Holy Spirit Parakletos. It's used of Jesus one time here in 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. The word parakletos, how it's used, is used as helper. Helper. Advocate. Okay, how is he how is he helping? Well, by advocating. Well, what does that really mean, advocating? We'll talk about that in a second. But the idea of function of, of the parakletos is not idea of, of title but rather a function. The Holy Spirit helps. He was helping the apostles, helping them remember, helping them give them truth, teaching them all the ways, giving them empowerment to do what is necessary in, in for the fame of Jesus Christ. And here, once again, Jesus is not the parakletos. He is not a title. Rather, for every believer who sins, and specifically in this situation, the believer who falls prey to that sin, he helps them grace beyond grace he is a parakletos with the father the word with there's a word for myth and with in greek with in greek it is uh, meta means with here the word is pros pros is a word that means in front and facing they're facing one another so jesus when somebody sins, specifically when they are actually caught in this deception or they're not fixing it, is still there to the face of the Father. What does this mean, though? This helper, what is he doing? In his action on the cross and now sitting at the right hand of Father, facing the Father, he satisfied the penalty for sin for all time. In Hebrews chapter 1, verses 3 through 4, he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he has made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much better than the angels as he inherited a more excellent name than they. Chapter 3, verse 1. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider Jesus the apostle, the high priest of our confession. When you deal with who Jesus Christ is, he is our high priest. And here's the beauty of it. It's not like we have to ask Jesus to advocate. In fact, Jesus doesn't sit there and argue with God, the Father. It's not like the Father's going to go, okay, I'm going to get him. And Jesus goes, no, don't. That's not what's happening. Okay? His presence there with the father having made complete satisfaction for sins is the advocacy okay 
Jesus Christ's position at the right hand of the Father after making purification for sins satisfies God's wrath by simply him being there. He's not arguing. Do I know that for certain? I don't have this in my notes, but please turn over to Romans chapter 8. Verse 31, read a few verses from there. Verse 31, Romans 8, 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? Who, he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is the one who died. Yes, rather was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. You realize being in him, being that Jesus Christ made purification for all sins for all time, means no one can even bring a charge against you. Now, that doesn't mean that every single activity is not a sin. It does not mean that every single activity pleases God. What it means is our standing with God cannot be altered based upon our activity or inactivity. Now, if you said that about any other courtroom, any other life, our family, friends, politics, judicial nature, that is insane. It is insane. But before, because God is the one who made the sacrifice, that sacrifice is free and complete and forever. We cannot break it, no matter how hard we try. And we try very hard. So how do we know that Jesus will help if a person should sin in this situation. Doesn't mean that God's happy with you. It doesn't mean that you're pleasing God. It doesn't mean that you're not breaking fellowship with the apostles or other people within your believers. But if you're going to sit there, if, 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 if I or Luther or, or Dan stood up and said, you know what, I don't think Jesus is the Christ, we would probably say, get out, don't come back. I hope so. Don't tolerate it. Don't let me say it. Kick me out. Don't give me a chance to finish. Give me the whole, you know, that whole cook. Pull me off the stage if necessary. Tackle me. But if I, even if I said it, even if I believed it, he himself is the propitiation for that sin. Literally, and he propitiates, he is on behalf of the sins of ours. And he propitiation, he is. On behalf of the sins of ours. And I go, ah, Greek. I love Greek word order. It makes you go, what? Did Yoda write that? The first thing you want to notice about this is the he, he. And it's not laughing. There is a pronoun he right there. There's also a verb is. And there's a third, a third person singular with that which means we have an emphatic nature. He is, he really, really is our propitiation. It's, a, it's, a, it's an emphatic nature to demonstrate that he himself is the propitiation on behalf of the sins of ours. Propitiation um, is the word helosmos. Helosmos means appeasing. It's used in ancient Greek for, for trying to fix a problem with the gods. The Greek gods uh, demanded constant appeasing through various different sacrifices. Where did they get that idea from? Probably from the Old Testament, borrowing it, modifying it, making it to other individuals. But they were constantly asking for some type of appeasement. 
and they would do various different things, including sacrificing babies. Throwing babies in the fire would appease the gods for, and, and bring rain and whatnot. It's very interesting that every single uh, pagan society always went to human sacrifice, especially children. They never sacrificed themselves. Hey, I know what will ha ha make God happy. <laughs> no, I'll kill you instead. That's great. So this propitiation, what does the word propitiate, appeasement mean? Now, the word itself is not used constantly, but it has very deep theological concepts attached to this. First of all, it, we find in 1 John chapter 4, verse 10. And this, this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. There it is again. But it really doesn't help us define what propitiation means. Again, I think this is a well-known word. They don't go into defining it. It's used two times. You have one in Luke 18, verse 13, which is strange. But the tax collector standing some distance away was unwilling to lift his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. That word merciful means God propitiate to me. In other words, I can't do it. His claim is not be merciful. Rather, God, you propitiate for me. I can't do it. I'm a sinner. Great understanding, by the way. Fantastic understanding in this uh, statement that Jesus made. And in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17, we also have it. Therefore, he had to be made like his brethren in all things, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in these these things and things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Propitiation is also the word that is used in regard to what? The mercy seat. The word mercy seat is halasmos. In other words, when they came into the inner temple and sprinkled blood upon it, they were satisfying God's justice for a time. Jesus Christ became the eternal propitiation. It is if it was a permanent sprinkling of blood on that propitiation that they call it a mercy seat. So when you deal with sin, rebellion, activity that, that is against God and his truth, you talk about things that are done on accident, things that are done on purpose. Regardless, it doesn't matter what kind of sin it is. Bring it back to the problem in 1 John. In 1 John, the sin is denying that Jesus is the Christ. I would say that's pretty, that's, that's up there. But think of any sin. If you're a believer, when a person sins, God's justice places an obligation upon them. It's not a natural consequence. If you rob a bank, natural consequence, either getting violently returned or go to prison. Okay, that's a natural consequence of sin. Rather, it is the divine consequence or curse of a sin, possibly even death. This happened all the time in the Old Testament. But when Christ propitiates God's justice, what does that mean? That means from God's perspective on a supernatural level, dealing with it from his perspective, lightning bolts, uh, plagues, not having good produce, losing money, that kind of idea is propitiated in this economy. Why? Not because of who we are, but because of who Christ is. Propitiation is the concept of satisfying God's requirement because of sin. So when we deal with sin, when we look at sin in and of itself, we still act like we're under law. And when we do something foolish, stupid, or even rebel against God, we anticipate something bad happening to us. What we need to understand is that God propitiates that sin. Bring it back to a personal example. I was playing basketball in high school. I had all kinds of dreams and aspirations of potentially playing in Japan in the professional leagues. <laughs> so I was too short. I thought maybe I could make it there. I couldn't even make it there. Couldn't make it in college. <laughs> but I had dreams and aspirations, and I was not behaving as I should in my life. And I had a constant fear. 
of spraining an ankle, breaking a leg, pulling a hamstring, having an overnight. That's where you go over 13 in shots. Constantly fear, fear of that because I knew my life was not right. And I had my best season ever. And I began to doubt God's love for me because he was not smacking me down. What I had to come to realize later on was that was so foolish of me. Why? Because even though I knew I was living an act of rebellion against God in my life, he's propitiated it. Now, I had natural consequences of those sins, and I lived through those, but I did not have a supernatural whack punishment. Since we are in Christ and the Holy Spirit is in us, what sin can be committed that would cause a divine repercussion to sin? A believer incurs no divine punishment, curse, or separation due to sin, transgression, or rebellion. There may be natural consequences. There may be lack of fulfillment. But there is no divine punishment, curse, or separation. 1 Peter 3.18. For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Hebrews 10.10. 10. By this will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the blood of Jesus Christ once for all. Verse 18. Now, where there is forgiveness of these things, there is no longer any offering for sin. There's nothing you can do that would make up for your sin. Why? Because it's already forgiven. Romans 8. Therefore, thou, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, weak as it was to the flesh, God did. Sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. Let's pray. Thank Heavenly Father for your word that it is true. Help us to live in confidence, not confidence of sin, but confident understanding of who you are in regards to even our own rebellion so that we can live free, so that we understand that, that we're not held prisoner by our sin, that there is no shame. Rather, we can move forward with confidence, filling our spirit with truth, living in accordance with your truth, so that we can please you, even in our sinful life. We pray that we do not sin. Specifically, we don't want to rebel. We also pray that we limit the impact of sin in our lives. Help us to understand what you're talking to in, in regards to these particular beliefs.